In November of 2017, at the FIFA Executive Football Summit in Istanbul, President Gianni Infantino emphatically declared his intention to reform the practices of football agents worldwide. Yes, we will re-regulate uh, this, the, 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 the agent's system. Um, we have to do it. We have to find a way. We have to find a regulation which is transparent, which is clear. It's, I mean, anyone who does a job has the right to earn money. That's perfect. That's perfectly right. Uh, but it has to be done in a regulated uh, environment, and uh, we need to do that. Because now, almost four years later, and there's proposed regulation to do just that. But high-profile agents won't go down without a fight. And recently, they've been speaking out. It's people Paul, that never, you know, never did a transfer, that they actually don't know what our work is and what our job is or what we do and why are we needed or not needed. They just hear, okay, you know what, we need to regulate these people and it's people that even don't live in Europe that have, how that some of these people have ever seen football. That scathing attack was one of many this week by super agent Mino Raiola against FIFA. It appears agents and FIFA are on a collision course destined to end up in court. Today, we analyze the conflict and ask, why are football agents at war with FIFA? I think the relationship between agents generally and FIFA is is more nuanced than it's being projected only because there's obviously very high profile agents that are pretty angry with FIFA. Daniel G is a leading sports lawyer and author of Done Deal, an insider's guide to football contracts, multi-million pound transfers and Premier League big business. But they aren't necessarily representative of everybody. Uh, there are various agents groups, but it's fair to say that a lot of top agents are far from happy right now. You talk about top agents in football. This has been a busy week for Mino Raiola, you know, agent of Paul Pogba, Zlatan, and Erling Holland. You know, he and super agent Jonathan Barnett spoke with the Athletic this week. You know, what was the general gist of what they said in that interview? It was interesting on a number of levels because obviously they um, are. Uh, there's a number of anchors. One is the the general perception of agents in the industry or in particular jurisdictions. Another is obviously the fight that they have on their hands with FIFA over commission caps and other sort of reg- regulatory interventions. They were pretty clear about the fact that they didn't want to be handing over power generally to what they considered was a relatively corrupt um, FIFA organization. And they were sort of quite no holds barred on on that point. And I think the other interesting point was, you know, that their their main aim is to look after the, the current and future status of their players. And if that means ruffling feathers along the way, then so be it, which is, you know, a, a usual thing. Agents are in the profession to, to get the best deal they can for their for their players usually. And um, and no one should be under any illusion. It's any different. Were you surprised by any of their comments? I heard Jonathan speak at the FT Football Business Summit maybe a couple of months ago, uh, where he'd, he'd used similar quotes and um, had been uh, pretty outspoken about um, the, the FIFA position generally. And I think it's fair to say that there's a variety of stakeholders within that, that top agents group that are very unhappy with the way that FIFA have gone about doing things, um, primarily from a consultation perspective. Um, from speaking with certain selective agency groups, um, and and then obviously the, the the new agents regulations that are due to come out at some point within the next uh, period of time, which on a number of levels, if it's exam, if it's um, professional development, if it's a lot of money going through FIFA, if it's transparency as to the monies and the agents that are doing the deals, and most importantly. This commission cap obviously puts a number of agents and agents groups on a collision course with FIFA in the in the courts in the near future. What did you make of their interview? Was there anything, um, you know, do you have any thoughts or opinions on it? Well, it, it's combative, but it's nothing that I wouldn't expect from two of the, the most well-renowned, prolific, high-profile agents in the business where there is a, 
external regulatory shift that will fundamentally uh, limit their ability to be able to to do deals. I, I think if this was high profile agents across other entertainment sectors, they would be doing exactly the exactly the same thing. They're querying on a more fundamental level why there is an external body called FIFA that's even regulating agents in the first place, which, you know, th- there's one thing saying, should they be regulated? It's another question saying, is the right body the right body to regulate them? And that's a really interesting topic. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, you know, but something I found interesting was how both Raiola and Barnett said that perception of agents uh, was only really bad in England and that the reputation of agents wasn't really that bad elsewhere. You know, and Barnett kind of blamed it on the British press. You know, in your experience, do you see this as just a UK issue? Well, the point that uh, I'm quite explicit about set, setting out and for transparency's sake, I, I do work with a lot of agents and players. That is a lot of my day-to-day business. What I set out in my, bu- in my book, Done Deal, a while back, was just trying to equalize the uh, playing field in a way, which is, I, I think, generally agents have a, a bit of a bad rep that, you know, you can make, they make one phone call and do a multi-million pound deal and the, the commission comes their way without too much hard work. And my view, regardless of whether you think people's p- particular character traits or otherwise are wholesome or otherwise, it's a very, very difficult industry to maintain uh, relationships with over a long period of time, specifically because, you know, like any industry, there's limited uh, limited supply and limited demand in particular instances. And, you know, the top agents um, are doing a very good at managing and balancing club player coach technical directors and directors of football positions and they are really facilitators of information really and how to find angles and to find leverage and to provide benefits to to their clients and you know my my view is the perception of agents is driven to a lot of the extent i think i think from a lot of people that i speak to the first thing that usually comes up is are they make too much money and the truth is, is that it's, I don't see it as too much of the same issue in America, simply because of one fundamental difference that the athletes pay their agents the commission. Whereas in the UK and across Europe and in other parts of the world in, with regard to football, it is the clubs that pay on the player's behalf. And I think there is then this misinformation outrage about clubs, we saw the latest um, intermediary fee figures come out in the last few days. There is this almost um, outrage that clubs are paying players' agents too much. I'm positive there wouldn't be the same issue if it was pe- players paying their agents that amount. It's simply because it's the club paying them directly. So why do clubs pay the wages of agents and not the players? There's various different reasons and rationales and um, you know evolutions of tax systems is the truth. But I, I wrote a blog on it with one of the preeminent tax accountants um, at a, a company called Safaris that we do a lot of work with. And the, the truth is, is that I, I can't speak for other tax jurisdictions. And I, I'm granted, I know when we're starting to talk about tax, it might turn people off to an extent, <laughs> but bear with me just for 30 seconds, um, which is in, in the UK, in any event, players cannot deduct their agent's commission if they were to pay it themselves from their own income by way of that annual return from a tax perspective, which means that if that is not possible, but it is possible for other types of entertainment athletes, um, but isn't for more for team sports, then if that's the case, then there are more tax efficient ways of ensuring that the player's agent is paid. And the way that that usually happens is the club uh, incentivizing the player by saying to them, we will pay part of your agent's fees if you come to us. And the other part is usually paid for play for club services. So as you can probably see in various transactions, a club will pay on behalf of the player for player services and then will also pay the player's agent for club services. There's obviously the, the usual types of conflicts of interest that we can maybe go into as well. But that is how the, the, the tax system has basically evolved in the UK so that in effect, the players don't pay their agents out of their net salaries. You 
talk about the conflicts of interest. Let's talk about that now, I guess. You know, what are the conflicts of interest at play? And, you know, we always hear about, oh, the agent took the player here and is his is agent really working for the club or for the player? You know, can you talk about that for a little bit? Well, the underlying fundamental position from a fiduciary, a legal fiduciary duty standpoint is the, the, the agent has um, a fiduciary duty to his player, his or her player. And that fiduciary duty effectively means is you put yourself, the agent, in the position of being the player and then looking out for the player's best interests as the primary obligation for everything that then flows as a result. So um, if the primary obligation is to the player and then everything that is actioned as a result of that takes place, the issue that can be is when there are dual obligations to negotiate on behalf of the player, but then also operate on the, in the best interests of the club. And what usually happens there is that there will be a, a waiver that the player and the club and the agent effectively have to sign to, so that the player can demonstrate that he or she understands the conflict that is occurring, but they are happy to waive that conflict. And, and as you um, rightly say, there is actually more of a nuanced position because sometimes what can happen is although the player's agent might be acting for the player and the buying club, that is usually the way that things happen. Sometimes, and it's not outlawed at the moment, but I believe will be under the new FIFA regulations, if and when they come into force, that agents can actually, um, as well as representing the player, can be representing the selling club and the buying club. And, and, and that is almost a double conflict to a degree. And that's where I think FIFA are concerned about where incentives uh, may lie on particular transactions. Well, let's look at how FIFA's new laws or regulations might impact what we're talking about. You know, can you explain their recent proposal? Well, the, the, there's probably a uh, half a dozen important elements, but if I take maybe three or four of them, F FIFA for some time um, has recognized that, that they made a mistake in deregulating the, the, the agency market, uh, which was they, they put the obligations on the national associations to regulate how agents should be regulated. And as a result, there were lots of complications, if nothing more so that if you are an English agent wanting to move a French player to Italy, you'd potentially need to be registered in three different jurisdictions, which itself is a very big headache, never mind moving numerous players to numerous territories in numerous jurisdictions, full stop. But what, what FIFA were very much concerned about was big agents making very large sums. Um, and even though I believe that is very much the outlier position, there are very, very few incredibly large elite players moving for significant sums. Um, that is something that they were concerned about and the money flowing out of the game to a degree. So that the basic proposition by FIFA was that players, sorry, agents could only earn up to 6% capped for acting for the player and the buying club. And they separately could earn up to 10% of the transfer fee if acting for the selling club. So that was the, 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 the basic position on um, commission caps. And there was also another big piece about transparency. So um, I, I believe FIFA are looking to try and work out how to disclose on quite a forensic basis which agents have done which deal and have earned how much from that potential deal. And, and then there's one other element, which is to do with um, the the, the re-regulation of agents so that there will be an exam to pass and that will then be um, continuing professional development obligations to ensure that um, you know, an agent has a global license and that continues on that education path so that they're fully aware of all of the different uh, international FIFA regulations that will apply to them as uh, as agents. So just how big are these proposed changes? Are they seismic or are they actually in, in not that really big? Well, I, I think on some points, a lot of agents would agree that an exam is important so that uh, agents understand the, the legal, regulatory and practical frameworks as was in place pre-2015. I think some things like the conflict of interest position uh, needs to be more nuanced than it possibly has been. I think the, uh, the, the main two big topics are transparency. How much detail will FIFA 
potentially publish as to each particular deal. And then the, the, the most important area is obviously the, the commission caps, because, you know, as right, rightly so, as you know, agents like Riola and um, Mendez and Barnett have, have touched on, or more than touched on, have been very vociferous in their views on, is that there aren't too many other entertainment industries, uh, regulators of entertainment industries that are capping market rates for where there might be supply uh, and demand. So kind of reading between the lines, it seems like that the cap is really what's angering some of these top agents. And, you know, it seems like it's really not potentially as as bad for maybe ordinary or low, lower level agents. It, it might actually be disproportionately disadvantageous for lower agents because ultimately agents that um, are working with smaller players that are on lower wages will sometimes try and get higher percentage amounts because um, otherwise the deals might be relatively unprofitable for all of the um, the work that gets carried out. So usually the higher value deal, the reduced percentage can sometimes be. Obviously, there are different anomalies in that. But, um, you, you know, there have been proposals put forward which are stepped amounts, stepped capped percentages, depending on what the commission rate and the underlying wages and the transfer fees might be, so that it dis- doesn't disproportionately disadvantage the vast majority of agents that aren't earning huge sums, but are, you know, um, making a decent living from the industry without, you know, being capped at what one effective uni- universal percentage rate. A spokesman for FIFA said in a statement to The Guardian, quote, in particular, FIFA has observed a growing number of abusive practices, widespread conflicts of interest, and a market driven by speculation rather than solidarity and redistribution across the football pyramid, end quote. You know, do you believe what FIFA is saying is correct? You know, that it's widespread and that, you know, they're, this is getting worse? Well, it depends what we what we're talking about there. If we take each bit and turn slightly, abusive practices. I'm I'm not entirely sure what that necessarily means in practice. I'm not sure whether abusive practices means very high commission rates or it means that agents are being incentivized, for example, to try and make a, um, a move for a player when a player doesn't necessarily want to move. You know, I, I sometimes think it's a lot more nuanced than, than, than that. Um, a lot of the time, agents, through the way that they are paid, are actually incentivized to sometimes keep the player at the club because they're only going to get particular commission installments if in two years the player is still there. So sometimes that's not necessarily the case. On the conflicts of interest point, I I think it's difficult to be involved in three parts of the deal um, without there being skewed incentives. So I think players probably need to be educated as to uh, where particular conflicts of interest arise and ensuring that they're fully aware and cognizant of of what's going on. I think some of the other ideas around conflicts of interest and abusive practices are things that I haven't seen in my practice is truth. But, you know, when you're when um, agents are working with high profile players and players in demand, whether actually agents are uh, in order to start a negotiation or negotiating their commission first to say, well, unless you're paying me five million euros up front with X amount this time and this time, then we're not even having those conversations. I think that happens is truth regardless of the commission caps and at different times. That's just, um, I'm not saying that's correct or proper, but by the sounds of reporting, that type of thing does go on. I'm not sure any of the FIFA reforms really go to the heart of dealing with those type of things. And the transfer market is inherently speculation driven as well as being uh, redistributive. There's been lots of studies around how redistributive the transfer system is full stop that I don't need to go into. But Stefan Szymanski has done a lot of work on that. Ultimately, an agent is there to benefit their player as much as possible. And, it, and if that means... Uh, driving the price up or down or creating leverage by speaking out or telling people to buy out b- about release clauses or buyout clauses in order to get a move or for players to agitate for moves for different reasons, then, you know, that's all within the bounds of, you know, what an agent and a player will be doing to, you know, maximize what is usually quite a short window for the player to to, to earn a living. Now, it's kind of assumed that FIFA's council will vote to approve this as Gianni Infantino seems to be supportive of these reforms. 
from a legal standpoint, can this all be enacted? It seems like the agents will fight this. The agents are definitely fighting this. Is there the potential of legal action? Should there be a stalemate here? Absolutely. I think it, it has to be the last result. We will try everything to do with FIFA. We will tr try to the last, last minute to resolve the problem. But being, let them be royal assured, if necessary, we'll go to every court in the land, around the world. In a way, that's the, that, that's the narrative that is, that is playing out in the public eye um, at present. These high-profile agents have significant resources, have the ability to be able to you know, instruct the best lawyers from around the world and will engage them in particular jurisdictions around the world to, to stop FIFA being able to enact the particular regulations probably around the, this commission cap. And a lot of it comes down to something that I've, I, I work, the industries that I worked a lot in, which is the competition law but obviously the sports sector as well and the competition law arguments are around whether uh, an external agency FIFA not only has the power but can can legally restrict the ability for um, agents to charge what they think is appropriate for their services and that is what this is going to come down to whether an agreement between national associations i.e FIFA to prevent, restrict or distort competition in the agency commission market is uh, is legal. And that will come down to probably EU law principles that will have to be decided upon based on probably referrals to the European courts from um, national courts. Could we have a situation where there are different agent structures or regulations depending on where in the world you are? It's a good point, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't really considered that to the same degree, only that because competition rules obviously differ by territories, the EU being one of the biggest competition blocks, I think that's where a lot of these, uh, these issues are going to be tested out in. But ultimately, EU law doesn't apply to a degree um, in other jurisdictions, apart from when there are territorial issues about working in particular jurisdictions. So that there is the possibility of disparities of regulations depending on jurisdictions. But I think ultimately, if a decision was found in favour of FIFA in the European courts, for example, I think that uniformity or consistency of approach might well be likely in other jurisdictions too. How messy do you think this could get? Well, it's already messy to a degree in that you can see everybody uh, ploughing their battle lines, really unless there is quite a fundamental shift in position from FIFA and the, the larger agencies and agency associations, there's going to be court proceedings pretty soon. I think the issue at the moment is, is that there can't really be court proceedings until the regulations are voted in. So because at the moment there are only potential regulations. So once the regulations are in, then it will be I presume lawyers and barristers going to particular territories and beginning actions in those national jurisdictions to either injunct or freeze or somehow temporarily restrain the, the regulations, especially the commission regulations from coming into a force in advance then of substantive submissions around the competition law principles of why these rules are uh, legal or otherwise. Could there be a simpler solution to this? You mentioned earlier in the episode the tax code. Could we just change that? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, again, I'm not the I'm not the tax guy, but you know, speaking with a lot of people inside and outside of the industry, and then speaking with a lot of tax accountants as well, you know, the, the fundamental point about at least English tax law to a degree or UK tax law is, whereas elite sportsmen and women um, in tennis and golf, for example, my understanding is can um, deduct um, agents' commission from their annual return. Employee sports like rugby and football, for example, can't. So if, for example, there was a change in the tax code to a degree so that a footballer could deduct his or her agent's commission from their annual return or through the PAYE system, then I just wonder whether things would actually be a lot more simpler and, uh, and, and this system of potential conflicts of interest and the way that agents are paid through a player's club wouldn't necessarily be as, um, as difficult.
Daniel G is a leading sports lawyer and author of Done Deal, an insider's guide to football contracts, multi-million pound transfers, and Premier League big business. The music for this episode was provided under the Creative Commons license by Blue Dot Sessions, and you can find more information about those songs in the episode show notes. This episode was produced by myself and John McKenzie. I'm Josh Schneiderweiler. Thanks for listening to Football Today.